Preface to Non-Combatants and Others. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Non-Combatants and Others by Rose Macaulay. Preface. Let the foul scene proceed. There's laughter in the wings. "'Tis sawdust that they bleed, but a box death brings. "'Gigantic dins uprise. "'Even the gods must feel a smarting of the eyes "'as these fumes upsweal. "'Strange such a piece is free, while we spectators sit, "'aghast at its agony, yet absorbed in it. "'Dark is the outer air, cold the night draughts blow. "'Mutely we start and stare, at the frenzied show yet heaven has its quiet shroud of deep and starry blue we cry an end we are bowed by the dread tis true while the shape who hoofs applause behind our deafened ear hoots angel-wise the cause and affrights even fear walter de la mer the marionettes war is just the killing of things and the smashing of things and when it is all over then literature and civilization will have to begin all over again they will have to begin lower down and against a heavier load the wild asses of the devil are loose and there is no restraining them what is the good wilkins of pretending that the wild asses are the instruments of providence kicking better than we know it is all evil. Reginald Bliss. Boon. There is work for all who find themselves outside the battle. Romain Roland. Above the battle. End of preface. Part 1, Chapter 1 of Non-Combatants and Others by Rose Macaulay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Wood End. Chapter 1. John Comes Home. In a green late April evening, among the dusky pine shadows, Alex drew Percival Briggs. Percival stood with his small cleft chin lifted truculently, small blue eyes deep under fair frowning brows, one scratched brown leg bare to the knee, dirty hands thrust into torn pockets. He was the worst little boy in the wood, and had been, till six months ago, the worst little boy in the Sunday school class of Alex's cousin Dorothy. He had not been converted six months ago, but Dorothy, like so many, had renounced Sunday school to work in a VAD hospital. Alex, who was drawing Percival, worked neither in a Sunday school nor in a hospital. She only drew. She drew till the green light became green gloom, lit by a golden star that peered down between the pines. She had a pale, narrow, delicate, irregular sort of face, broad-browed, with a queer, cynical, ironic touch to it, and purple-blue eyes that sometimes opened very wide and sometimes narrowed into slits. When they narrowed, she looked as from behind a visa, critical, defensive or amused. When they opened wide, she looked singularly unguarded, as if the bars were up and she, unprotected, might receive the enemy's point straight and clean. Behind her on the wood path was a small donkey between the shafts of a small cart. A rough yellow dog scratched and sniffed and explored among the roots of the trees. Alex said to Percival, That will do, thank you. Here you are. And fished out sixpence in coppers from her pocket. And he clutched and gripped them in a small retentive fist. Alex, who was rather lame, put her stool and easel and charcoal into the cart, got in herself, beat the donkey, and ambled off along the path, followed by the yellow dog. 
The evening was dim and green and smelt of pines. The donkey trotted past cottage gardens, and they were sweet with wallflowers. More stars came out and peered down through the treetops. Alex whistled softly a queer little Polish tune, indeterminate, sad and gay. 2. Two miles up the path, a side-track led off from it, and this the donkey-cart took till it fetched up in a little yard. Alex climbed out, unharnessed the donkey, put him to bed in a shed, collected her belongings, and limped out of the yard, leaning a little on the ivory-top stick she carried. She had had a diseased hip-joint as a child, which had left her right leg slightly contracted. She came round into a garden. It smelt of wallflowers and the other things which flower at the end of April, and underneath all these of pines. The pine woods came close up to the garden's edge, crowding and humming like bees. Pine needles strewed the lawn. The tennis lawn, it was most summers, but this summer one didn't play tennis. One was too busy. So the lawn was set with croquet hoops, a wretched game, but one which wounded soldiers can play. Dorothy used to bring them over from the hospital to spend the afternoon. An oblong of light lay across the lawn. It came from the drawing-room window, which ought, of course, to have been blinded against hostile aircraft. Alex, standing in the garden, saw inside. She saw Dorothy just in from the hospital, still in her V.A.D. dress. The light shone on her fair wavy hair and fair pretty face. Not even a stiff linen collar could make Dorothy plain. Margot was there too, in the khaki uniform of the women's volunteer reserve. She had just come in from drilling. She usually worked at the Woolwich canteen in the evenings, but had this evening off because of John. She was making sandbags. Their mother, Alex's aunt Eleanor, was pinning tickets on clothes for Belgians. She was tall and handsome, and like Alex's mother, only so different, and she was secretary of the local Belgian committee, as of many other committees, local and otherwise. She often wore a little worried frown, and was growing rather thin, on account of the habits of this unfortunate and scattered people. One of them had been their guest since November. She was in the drawing-room now, a plump, dark-eyed girl, knitting placidly and with the immense rapidity noticeable on the continent, and not to be emulated by islanders without exhaustion. Alex's uncle Gerald, a special constable, which was why he need not bother about his blinds much, stood by the small fire, they were wholesome people and not frowsty, with an evening paper, but he was not reading it, he was talking to John. For among them the centre of the family was John, John wounded and just out of hospital and home on a month's sick leave, John with a red scar from his square jaw to his square forehead, stammering as he talked because the nerves of his tongue had been damaged. Alex, watching from the garden, saw the queer way his throat worked, struggling with some word. They were asking John questions, of course, Sensible questions, too. They were sensible people. They knew that the conduct of this campaign was not in John's hands, and that he did not know so much more about it than they did. The room, with its group of busy, attractive, efficient people, seemed to the watcher in the dark, piney garden, full of intelligence and war and softly shaded electric light. Alex narrowed her eyes against it and thought it would be paintable. 3. The dark round eyes of the Belgian girl, looking out through the window, met hers. She laughed and waved her knitting. She took Alex always as a huge joke. Alex had from the first taken care that she should, since the moment when Mademoiselle Vestigal had arrived, fluent with tales from Antwerp. It is a safe axiom that those who play the clown do not get confidences. The others looked out at her too when Mademoiselle Verstigal waved. They called out, Hello, Alex. How late you are. 
John's been here two hours. Come along. Alex limped up the steps and in at the French window, where she stood and blinked, the light on her pale, pointed face and narrowed eyes. John rose to meet her, and she gave him her hand and her crooked smile. "'You're all right now, aren't you?' she said, and John, an accurate person, said, "'Very nearly.' while his mother returned, I'm afraid he's a long way from all right yet. Isn't it funny it makes him stammer, said Dorothy, who was professionally interested in wounds. But he's getting quite nice and fat again. Not so fat as I was when I got hit, said John. The trenches are the best flesh-producing ground known. High living and plain thinking and no exercise. The only people who are getting thin out there are the stretcher-bearers, who have to carry burdens, the commander-in-chief who has to think, the newspaper men who have to write when there's nothing to say, and the chaplains who have to chaplain. I met old Leonard of Katz walking about Armentier in February, and I thought he was the Bishop of Zanzibar, he'd gone so lean. When last I'd seen him, he was rolling down King's Parade, arm in arm with Chesterton, and I couldn't get by. It was an awfully sad change. By the way, you all look thinner. Well, we're not in the trenches, said Margot. We're leading busy and useful lives, full of war activities. Besides, our food costs us more. But Dorothy and I are fairly hefty still. It's Mother who's dwindling, and Alex, though she's such a lazy little beggar. Alex is hopeless. She does nothing but draw and paint. She could earn something on the stage, as a special star turn, the girl who isn't doing her bit. She doesn't so much as knit a body belt, or draw the window curtains against Zepps. Alex looked round from the window to stick out the tip of her tongue at Margot. Mais elle est boiteuse, la pauvre petite, put in the Belgian girl, with a literalness that makes this people a little difficile in home life. What can she do? Alex giggled in her corner. Margot said, All right, mademoiselle, we're only ragging. There's the post. She went out to fetch it. Margot was a good girl, but like so many others, tired of Belgians, though this Belgian was a nice one, as strangers in a foreign land go. Alex hated and feared her whole nation. They had been through altogether too much. Margot came back with the letters. Betty and Terry, she said with satisfaction. Betty's is for me, and Terry's for you, mother. Terry was in France. Betty driving an ambulance car in Flanders. Two for you, Alex. Alex took hers, which were both marked on active service, and put them in her pocket. Simultaneously, her Aunt Eleanor began to read Terry's aloud. It was about flies, and bread and jam, and birds, and some music he had made, and was sending home to be kept safe. And Margot began to read extract from Betty's, about nails and bad roads and different kinds of shells and people. And Uncle Gerald read bits out of the paper about Hill 60 and Hartmann's Weilerkopf and Zed El Bar and the Leon Gambetta and Licker and Mr Lloyd George. 4. Alex slipped out at the window and limped round to the side door and into the house and upstairs to the schoolroom which she was allowed to use as a studio. It was littered with things of hers, easels, chalks, paints, piles of finished and unfinished drawings and paintings. Some hung on the walls, some of hers and some by the writer of the letter she took out to read. He painted better than she did, but drew worse, or had in the long days ago when persons of his age and sex were drawing and painting at all. Alex read the letter. It was headed obscurely with an R, some little figures of men, and two weeping eyes, which was where the writer was for the moment stationed. Every now and then a phrase or sentence was erased. The writer, apparently a man of honour, had censored it himself. His honour had not carried him so quixotically far as to erase the hieroglyphics at the head of the paper. It said... Dear Alex, since I last wrote, we have been moved some miles. I mustn't, of course, indicate where to. It is nice country, less flat than the other place, 
and jolly distant ridges, transparent blue and lavender coloured. I'll do a sketch when we get into billets at the end of the week. My company is in the trenches now. Commodious trenches they are, the best in the line, but rather too near the people opposite for comfort. They're such noisy lunatics. It's eight o'clock now, and they've begun their evening hate. They do a bit every evening. The only creature they've strafed tonight yet is a brown rat, whom we none of us grudge them. It's interesting the different noises the shells make coming. You can nearly always tell what kind they are. If I was musical, I'd make a symphony out of them. I should think your cousin Terry Orme could. Some of them scream, thin and peevishly, like a baby fretting, some howl like a hyena, some mew like a kitten. Then there's Lord George's special, which says, Lloyd, 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 and then all the men shout, George. A page of further discursion on shells, too technical for reproduction here. Then resume next morning. I'm fairly sleepy this morning. We had to stand two from two to six a.m., expecting an attack which never came off. I wish it had. It would have been a way to get warm. We've had poor luck tonight. The Tommy who was sent over the top to look at the wire was made into a French landlord, and our sergeant major stoppered one with his head, silly ass. He was simply asking for it. It's my belief he was trying to get back to Blighty, but I hope they won't send him further than the base. You would like to see the dawn coming over this queer country, grey and cold and misty. I watched it through my perry for an hour. The Bosch lay perdu in their trenches mostly, but sometimes you'd see one looming over his parapet through the mist. I want some tea now more than most things. You might write soon. You never answered my last, so it's generous of me to be writing again. How's everyone at the school, and how's life and work? Your enemies, the Ruski, seem to be in a tight place, don't they? Yours, Basil Doy. Alex read this letter rather quickly. It bored her. It concerned the things she least preferred to hear about. That was, of course, the worst of letters from the front. Life at Wood End, as at other homes, was full of letters from the front. They seemed to Alex like bullets and bits of shrapnel crashing into her world with her various tunes. She might, from her nervous frown, have been afraid of stopping one. She twisted up the letter into a hard ball with her thin, double-jointed fingers as she stared frowning at a painting on the wall. The painting was of a grey-green pond, floored with a thin, weedy scum. A hole-riddled, battered old tin rode in the middle of it. Reeds stood very quietly round. A broken boot was half sunk in the mud among them. Over it all brooded and slept a heavy June noon. It was well painted. Alex thought it the best thing Basil Doy had ever done. They had spent an afternoon by the pond in June 1914. Alex remembered it vividly. The sleepy brooding silence, the heavy fragrance of the hawthorn, the scum green pond, the tin and the boot, the suggestion of haunting that they had talked of at the time and that Basil had got rather successfully into his picture afterwards. Those were curious days, those old days before August 1914, or rather it was the days ever since that were curious, and like a nightmare. Before that, life was of a reality, a sanity, an enduringness, a beauty. It still was, only it was choked and confused by the unspeakable things that everyone thought mattered so much, but which were really evil dreams, to be thrown off impatiently. Underneath them all the time, the real things, the enduring things, green ponds, music, moonlight, loveliness, ran like a choked stream. Alex read her other letter, which was from her young brother Paul, and also written in a trench. The chief thing she thought about this was that Paul's handwriting was even worse than usual. He wrote in pencil on a very small piece of paper, and scrawled up and down wildly. He might have been twelve instead of eighteen and a half. 
Paul was rather a brilliant boy. When the war broke out, he had been a distinguished head of his school and had just obtained a particularly satisfactory Oxford scholarship. His letters since he went to the front in March had been increasingly poor in quality and quantity. It made Alex angry that he should be out there. She thought it no place for children, and, as Paul's elder by nearly seven years, she knew all about his nerves. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of Non Competence and Others by Rose Macaulay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. John Talks. Alex, you'll be late for dinner. Dorothy's voice called across the landing. Alex went to the big bedroom she shared with Dorothy and Margot. Margot was hooking up her frock. Dorothy was washing with vigour and as much completeness as her basin would allow and complaining that John was occupying the bathroom. I hate not having a bath after hospital, but one can't grudge it to the dear lamb. How do you think he looks, Alex? Rather nervy he is still. That's the worst of a head wound. You know Marnie, Margot, that Munster Fusilier's man with a bit of shrapnel in his forehead? The other men in Ward 5 say he still keeps jumping out of bed in his sleep and standing too. The only way they can get him back is to say, Jack Johnson overhead, and then he scuttles into bed and puts his head under the pillow. Only sometimes he scuttles under the bed instead, and then the only way they can get him out is to say, Minnie's coming, and he nips out quick for fear of being buried alive. I believe he frightened one of the young ladies he walks out with into fits one day, by thinking he saw snipers in the trees. Of course, one never knows how much of it is putting on for a joke. He's so silly. But he is badly wrecked, too. Margot said, Isn't Marnie having massage now? Nan Goddard said she thought she was going to have him to do. She has four every morning now. She likes Marnie. She thinks he looks such an innocent little dear. Dorothy said, Innocent, did she? Marnie? Oh, well, she'll get to know him better if she has him for massage. Did you hear Marnie and Macpherson's latest exploit? This need not be here retailed. It is well known that a convalescent hospital containing forty soldiers is not without its episodes and provides many fruitful topics of conversation. They dress meanwhile. Dorothy in white muslin was fair-skinned and fresh, with shining light brown hair and honest grey eyes. Margot in yellow tussaw had hair a shade darker and curlier, and her eyes were hazel. They were both very nice to look at, and had pleasant, clear, loud voices with which they talked about soldiers. Alex put on an old green shantung frock and a string of amber beads. She looked thin, childish, elf-like. Her eyes were rather narrowed under brooding brows. 2. They were at dinner. Alex sat opposite John, who wore a dinner jacket again as if there were no war. He looked brown and square and cheerful. Between the daffodils Alex saw his eyes, nervous and watchful, with the look in them that was in so many young men's eyes in these days. Next to him was Mademoiselle Verstigel, stolid, placid, eating largely, saying little. Mr. Orme spoke of the big advance they all believed was coming directly. Not yet, said John. No, not enough shells. Wish I could go and help make some, said Margot. They all discussed the munitions question. John had strong views on it, differing in some particulars from his father's. John related the inner history of several recent episodes of war to support his view. He was very interesting. John was not naturally an anecdotal person, but his mind had been of late stored and fed with experiences. Some officers are reduced by trench life to an extreme reticence. The conversational faculty of others is stimulated. Nervous strain works in both of these ways, often in the same person. Anyhow, John had to talk about the war tonight, 
because at Wood End they all did. He answered his father's questions about barbed wire, his mother's about dugouts, his sister's about things to eat. They asked him all the things they hadn't liked to ask him while he was in hospital, for fear of setting his brain working and retarding his recovery. Dorothy wanted to know if it was true what the men said, that their bully beef often climbed out of its tin and walked down the trench. John said it was not, and that it was one of the erroneous statements he had most frequently to censor in the men's letters. Margot wanted to know what sort of meals he had in the trenches. John said mess in the dugout usually consisted of six courses, preceded by vermouth, three drinks and coffee. He proceeded to describe the courses in detail. His mother wanted to know about the nights, whether he got any sleep. John said yes, quite a lot, when it didn't happen to be his watch. What about the noise? his mother asked. Had he got at all used to it yet? John said it wasn't nearly so noisy as the Royal Free Hospital, where he had spent the last month. His father asked what he thought of the German soldiers as clean fighters. John said they seemed much like anybody else, as far as he'd noticed. Mademoiselle Verstigel, understanding this, shook her head in protest. His mother asked, did he think it was true that our Tommies were learning to pray, or was the contrary statement truer, that they were losing such faith as they had? John said he had not himself noticed either of these phenomena in his platoon, but he might, of course, ask them. His father, who was interested both as a person of intelligence and as a man of business in the Balkans, got there, and they discussed the exhausting and exhaustive topic of those wild and erratic states, the relations of each to other, to the central powers, to the allies, and to the war, at some length. It was the period when people were saying that Greece would come in for us, that Romania might, and it was essential to collar Bulgaria. So they said these things duly. 3. In a pause, John said to Alex across the table, What's Aunt Daphne doing now? There was a slight sense of jar. Margot, who was sympathetic, was ashamed for Alex, because of what her mother, Daphne Sandomir, was doing. For this always unusual lady, instead of being engaged in working for the Red Cross, Belgian refugees or soldiers and sailors' families, was attending a peace conference in New York. She had gone there from France, which she had been helping the friends to reconstruct. She was not a friend herself, not holding with institutional religion, but she admired their ready obedience to the constructive impulse. She was called by some a pacificist, by more a pacifist, by others a pro-German, by most a member of the Union of Democratic Control, which she was not, for reasons which she was ready to explain, but which need not be here detailed. Alex told John in her clear, indifferent, rather melancholy little voice about the peace conference. In common with many children of two intensely enthusiastic parents, her father had been a Polish liberationist who had died in a Russian prison, she had a certain half-cynical detachment from an indifference to ardours and causes. Her mother was always up to some stirring enterprise, always pursuing some vividly seen star. She had been at Newnham in the days when girls went to college ardently, full of aims and ideals and self-realisations and great purposes, instead of as now, because it seems the natural thing to do after school for those with any leanings towards learning, and she had lived her life at the same high pitch ever since. Alex found her admirable but discomposing. She found Alex engaging, even intriguing, but narrow-hearted, selfish and indolent. She accused her of shrinking from the world's griefs in a way unworthy of her revolutionary father, whom she closely resembled in face and brain. John was rather interested in the peace conference. He had read something about it the other day in one of the periodicals which flourished in the university to which he belonged, and which wholly approved of the enterprise. Not that John, for his part, wholly approved of the periodical. 
he found it a trifle unbalanced, heady, partisan. John was a very fair-minded and level-headed young man, of conservative traditions, but independent too. When the temporary second lieutenant, with both legs blown off, who had occupied the next bed to his in the Royal Free, had said, perusing the comments on the peace conference in the periodical in question, under the heading A Triumph of Pacifism, "'What sickening piffle, isn't it?' John had said after a little cogitation, "'Well, I don't know. They mean well.' The legless lieutenant, Trinity Hall, had snorted, "'They mean well to the Bosch, after all our trouble, all the legs we've lost, to cave in now. Besides, what do they think they can do? A lot of people gassing. I wonder who they are.' John had said he believed one of his aunts was keen on it. "'Sort of thing aunts would be keen on,' the other youth had vaguely and indeed quite inaccurately commented." On the whole, John didn't much hold by such movements, but he took a more lenient view of them than the rest of his family did. His father said, A little premature, discussing peace terms before we know we're going to be in a position to dictate them. His mother murmured, Peace, peace, where there is no peace, and smiled kindly at Alex to comfort her for her mother. Dorothy said, answering her father, Well, of course we know we are. "'But I don't see any use in discussing things beforehand, anyhow. "'We shall be able to think when the time comes.' "'Mademoiselle looked with her round black eyes from one to another like a robin. "'She might have been reflecting in her mind that Dorothy was very English, "'Mr Orme very depressing, Mrs Orme very kind, "'John very impartial, and Alex very indifferent.' What she said, turning to John, was, and she would seem to have been preparing the remark for some time, she was very keen on improving her English. The war is truly devilish, yes. The Bosch are not as humans, no. More is it not, monsieur, as the devils from below. John grinned. Dorothy said, True for you, mademoiselle. Margot said, You're really coming on, only you must say like, not as. As only comes in books, it's too elegant, and devilish isn't elegant enough. Elegant, Mademoiselle repeated the word softly. She was perhaps wondering whether it was necessary to be elegant at all in one's references to the Bosch. 4. After dinner they got out a map of the Western Front and spread it on a table, and made John say, so far as he knew, in which parts of the line the various battalions at the moment were, and Dorothy wrote their names, very small, all down the line. Alex slipped away while they were doing this to smell the garden. Soon they began to sing in the drawing-room. Margot sang, When We Wind Up the Watch on the Rhine, a song popular among soldiers just then. She was no doubt practising for canteen concerts. John joined in the chorus in a baritone voice somewhat marred by trench life. Alex went indoors and up to bed. She was shivering as if she was cold or very tired or frightened. She undressed hastily, whistling shrilly, and got into bed and pulled the bedclothes up round her neck and read Mr Clive Bell's last book, with much of which she differed violently, so violently that she made marginal and unsympathetic notes on it in pencil as she lay. "'I'll send it to Basil and see what he thinks,' she thought. Then Dorothy and Margot came up, merry and talking. "'You are a lazy little unsociable slacker,' Margot told her. "'John was telling us such ripping stories, too. Make him tell you tomorrow about the sergeant major and the pheasant and the barbed wire. It was awfully funny.' Dorothy yawned. "'Oh, I'm sleepy. Thank goodness it's Sunday tomorrow, so we can lie in. Margot, you've pinched my slippers. Oh, no, all right.' Alex lay and read. Her cousins undressed and said their prayers and got into bed. "'Ready, Alex?' asked Margot, her finger on the switch. "'Ready,' said Alex, putting Mr Clive Bell under her pillow, where, deeply as she differed from him, he seemed to lie as a protection against something.' The switch clicked, and the room was in darkness. Margot and Dorothy murmured on drowsily, 
dropping remarks about the hospital, the canteen, things John had said. The remarks trailed away into sleep. 5. Alex lay awake. Her forehead was hot and her feet were cold. She was tense and on the brink of shivering. Staring into the dark, she saw things happening across the seas. Dreadful things, ugly, jarring, horrifying things. War, war, war. It pressed round her. There was no escape from it. Everyone talked it, breathed it, lived in it. Aunt Eleanor with her committees and her terrible refugees, Mademoiselle Verstigel with her round robin's eyes that had looked horror in the face so near, Uncle Gerald with his paper and his intelligent city rumours, Dorothy and Margot with their soldiers who kept coming to tea, cheerful, charming and maimed, John damaged and stammering with his nervous eyes and his quiet humorous trench talk, Basil writing from his dugout of Bosch and shells, little Paul out there in the dark. They were all up against the monster, being strangled. It was like that beastly Laocoon. There was a balcony running along outside the bedrooms at the front of the house. The moonlight lay palely on it. Alex watched it through the long open window. Through the window came a sound of quiet gasping, choked sobbing, as if a child were in despair. Alex sat up in bed and listened. Margot and Dorothy breathed softly, each a peace-drugged column of bedclothes. Alex, pale and frowning, scrambled out of bed, shuddered and pattered on thin naked feet to the window and out onto the moon-bathed stone balcony floor. Outside his own window, John, barefooted, in pink pyjamas, stood, gripping with both hands onto the iron balustrade, his face turned up to the moon, crying, sobbing, moaning, like a little child, like a man on the rack. He was saying things from time to time, muttering them. Alex heard. Things quite different from the things he had said at dinner. Only his eyes, as Alex had met them between the daffodils, had spoken at all like this, and even that had not been like this. His eyes were now wide and wet, and full of a horror beyond speech. They turned towards Alex and looked through her, beyond her, unseeing. John was fast asleep. Alex, to hear no more, put her hands over her ears and turned and ran into the bedroom. She flung herself upon Dorothy and shook her by the shoulders, shook her till she sat up, startled and awake. Alex stammered, John, John, he's walking in his sleep out there. He's crying, he's talking. Go and stop him. Dorothy, efficient and professional in a moment, sprang out of bed into her two waiting slippers and ran into the balcony. Alex heard her, gentle, quiet, firm, soothing John, leading him back to bed. Alex was most suddenly and violently sick. When Dorothy came back twenty minutes later, she was huddled under the bedclothes, exhausted, shuddering and cold. "'He's quiet now,' said Dorothy, taking off her slippers. "'Poor old boy. They often do it, you know. It's the nervous shock. I must listen at nights.' I say, don't tell him, Alex. He wouldn't like it, especially to know he was crying. Poor old Johnny. Just the thing he'd never do, awake, however far gone he was. Not talking like that. He was saying awful things. Did you hear? Yes, said Alex in a small, faint voice. Dorothy looked at her curiously and saw her grey pallor and shut eyes. Why, you're ill too. I believe John is upset you. She spoke with a kindly pity and contempt. Is that it, Kitty? I don't know, said Alex. No, should think it was too many walnuts at dinner. Let's go to sleep now. Dorothy, before she did this, turned her head on the pillow towards Alex's corner and said kindly, You'll never be any use if you don't forget yourself, Alex. You couldn't possibly nurse if you were always giving in to your own nerves. 
After all, what they can bear to go through, we ought to be able to hear about. But of course you're not used to it, I know. You should come to the hospital sometimes. Good night. If you feel rotten in the morning, don't get up. Dorothy went to sleep. Alex lay and watched the shadows shifting slowly round up on the balcony and listened for sobbing, but heard only the quiet murmur of the pines. What they can bear to go through. But they can't, they can't, they can't. We can bear to hear about, but we can't, we can't, we can't. It was like the intolerable ticking of a clock and beat itself away at last into a sick dream. On the other side of the wall, John started and sat bolt upright in bed with wide, staring eyes. John, like many thousand others, would perhaps never sleep quietly through a night again. Yet John had been a composed sleeper once. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of Non Combatants and Others by Rose Macaulay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Alex goes. It was Sunday next day. Dorothy and Margot conducted a party of wounded soldiers to Matins. Mrs. Orme, who thought it time Mademoiselle Verstigel went to Mass again, sent her over to Wanford where there was a church of her persuasion. She herself had to go up to town to the Sunday club, where soldiers' and sailors' families were kept out of the streets and given coffee, news, friendship, music, and the chance to read good books, a chance of which Mrs. Orme, a sanguine person, hoped undiscouraged that they would one day avail themselves. Hope, faith and love were in her family. Her sister, Daphne Sandomir, when in England, held study circles of working women to instruct them in the principles which make for permanent peace, and hoped with the same fervour that they would read the books and pamphlets she gave them. Mr Orme and John walked over to the links to play golf. Alex, not having either the church, club or golf habit, and being unfitted for much walking, sat in the wood, tried to paint and failed. She felt peevish, tired, cross and selfish, and her head ached, as one's head nearly always does after being sick in the night. The pines were no good, stupid trees, the wrong shape. What sort of pictures would one be painting out there? Mud-coloured levels, mud-coloured men, splashes of green here and there, and red? And blue sky, or mud-coloured, with shells winging through it like birds, singing Lloyd, 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 Lloyd. The sort of picture Basil would be painting, and the way he would be painting it, she knew exactly. Only probably he wasn't painting at all today. It was Sunday hate day. Whiz-bangs, pom-poms, trench mortars, spinning along and bouncing off the wire trench roof. Minnie coming along to blow the whole trench inside out. Legs and arms and bits of men flying in the air, the rest of them buried deep in choking earth, perhaps to be dug out alive, perhaps dead. What was it John had said on the balcony? Something about a leg, the leg of a friend, pulling it out of the chaos of earth and mud and stones which had been a trench, thinking it led on to the entire friend, finding it didn't, was an attached bit, had John cried at the time? Been sick? Probably not. John was a self-contained young man. He had waited till afterwards, when he was asleep. Alex, seeing her friends in scattered bits, seeing worse than that, seeing what John had seen and mentioned with tears, turned the greenish pallor of pale ageing cheese and dropped her head in her hands. Painting was off for that morning, Painting and war don't go together. 2. Mrs Orme came home in the afternoon, tired but still energetic. Mr Orme and John came in to tea too, with Sunday papers, and having seen telegrams about the German offensive being stopped at Ypres. Callers dropped in to tea. 
They worried John by their questions. They kindly drew out Mademoiselle Verstigal in French worse than her English. Directly after tea, Margot had to hurry away up to town to the canteen. The callers dropped out again, one by one. John and his father went out to smoke in the garden and to look at young trees. Dorothy went to make a cake for the hospital. Mrs. Orme sorted, filed and pigeonholed case papers about Belgians. Alex, sitting in the window seat, said, "'Aunt Eleanor, I think I'm too far away from the school. I think I'd better go and stay in London to be nearer.' Mrs. Orme, abstracted part of her attention from the Belgians, paused, paper in hand, and looked at her niece with her fine, dark, kind eyes, that were like her sister's, only different. "'Very well, child. You may be right. I'm sorry, though.' She jabbed a paper on the file and gave more of her attention still. "'Go and stay in London. But with whom, dear? And what does your mother think?' "'Oh, mother,' said Alex, and gave her small, crooked smile. "'Mother won't mind. She never does. I'll write to her about it, any time. Well, I might be in rooms, alone or with someone else.' "'Not alone,' Mrs Orme said promptly. "'You're not old enough.' Twenty-five, is it? You look less. Oh, yes, I know girls do it, but I don't like it. I wouldn't let Dorothy or Margot. Who could you share them with? You've not thought of anyone especial? It would have to be someone sensible who'd look after you, or you'd get ill. Nicholas lives with another man, doesn't he? Wait, I've just thought of something. She began rummaging in her desk. I've a letter somewhere. I kept it, I know. She looked for it. Alex thought how like she was, as she searched, to her sister Daphne. Both were so often looking for papers which they knew they had kept, and both had the same short-sighted frown and graceful bend of the neck. Here, said Mrs. Orme, and held up an envelope addressed in a flowing hand, the sort of hand once used by most ladies, but now chiefly by elderly and middle-aged persons of an unliterary habit. "'Emily Frampton,' said Mrs. Orme. "'No, you wouldn't know her, but she's a cousin. That is, not a cousin, but married to one. She's the widow of your cousin Lawrence, who died fifteen years ago. None of us could think why. Well,' she checked herself, "'she's very nice and kind, Emily Frampton.' but so different she meant from their cousin Lawrence. This was so. Lawrence Frampton had been scholarly, humorous, keen-witted, dry-tongued, and a professor of Greek. Emily Frampton was not, which is sufficient description of her for the moment. She and her two girls, her own, you know, she was a widow even before she married Lawrence, live at Clapton, Violette Spring Hill, Upper Clapton N., they're poor, they want some nice person to board with them. She's very kind. You'd be taken care of. Mrs. Orme puckered her wide, white forehead and looked at Alex as if she were a Belgian with a case paper. Really, till your mother comes back and takes the responsibility, I can't let you go just anywhere. Well, Alex drawled a little, uncertainly, I don't like being taken care of, Aunt Eleanor and they sound dull. Well, dear, you must settle. I own I couldn't personally live at, what's the name of the house, geranium, pansy, no, violet, violet, I mean. Those sort of people are so dreadfully out of the current. Probably know nothing about the war, except that there is one. And, well, said Alex more quickly, perhaps I'll go there, Aunt Eleanor. I think I will. You'll be doing them a kindness, said Mrs. Orme, and of course it will be much more convenient for you than going up to town from here every day. If you like, I'll write to Mrs. Frampton today. We shall miss you, dear. She screwed up her eyes affectionately at Alex and added, You don't look well, child. I wish your mother would come home. You miss her. It's fun when mother's home, said Alex, but it's quieter when she isn't. Mother's so, so stimulating. "'Oh, very,' said Mrs. Orme, 
who thought of Mrs. Sandermere as a spoilt, clever, fascinating, but wrong-headed younger sister. She couldn't tell Alex how wrong-headed she found her mother, but she added kindly, "'You know, my dear, that I think she is mistaken in her present enterprise and will be much better at home.' "'Most enterprises are mistaken, all very likely,' said Alex, and her aunt was shocked, thinking she should not be cynical so young. "'The child's a funny outcome of Paul Sandemir and Daphne,' she reflected, and returned to her case papers. 3. John came in. Alex noticed how cheerful and placid he looked, and how his hand, holding his pipe, shook. He sat down and began to talk about the advantages of not digging up one of the lawns for potatoes, which Margot wanted to do. His memories lay behind his watchful eyes, safely guarded. But Alex knew. "'I must write to mother,' she said, and left the room. As she went upstairs, she met Mademoiselle Verstigel coming down. Her Sunday dress was bright scarlet, with canary-coloured ribbons. She had saved it out of the wreck at home when all seemed lost and fled in it like so many Belgians. She looked at Alex with her round eyes, and they too held memories. Alex stumbled at a stare. Mademoiselle caught her thin arm in her own plump one and saved her from falling. Alex hated the touch. She said, "'Oh, merci!' and gripped her stick tight and hurried on upstairs with her uneven, limping steps. She got into the schoolroom and shut the door. "'I must get away,' she said, breathing hard. "'I will go to Violette.' End of chapter 3part two chapter four of non combatants and others by rose macaulay this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by anthony ogus saturday morning at violette alex rode from south kensington to clapton in the warm mid-june night on the last bus she had been at a birthday party in margaretta terrace s w Bus two took her to the strand end of Chancery Lane. Here she left her companion, who had rooms in Clifford's Inn, and walked up Chancery Lane to Hoburn, and got the last Stamford Hill bus, and rushed up Gray's Inn Road, and then into the ugly, clamorous squalor of Theobald's Road, Clerkenwell, and Old Street. The darkness hid the squalor and the dull sordidness of the long, straight stretch of Kingsland Road. Through the night came only the flare of the street booths and the screaming of the very poor who never seemed too tired to scream. At Stamford Hill Alex got off and walked down Upper Clapton Road, which was quiet and dark, with lime trees. Alex softly whistled a tune that someone had played on a violin tonight at Audrey Hillier's party. The party and the music and the students' talk of art school shop, and the childish absurd jokes, and the chocolates and cigarettes, she had eaten eighteen and smoked five, were like a stimulating, soothing drug. A policeman at the corner of Spring Hill flashed his light over her and lit her up for a moment, hatless, cloaked, whistling softly, limping on a stick, with her queer narrow eyes and white face. She turned down Spring Hill, which is an inclined road running along the northern end of Springfield Park, down to the River Lee. It is a civilised and polite road, though its dwellings have not the dignified opulence of the houses round the common. Alex stopped at Violette and let herself softly in with her latch key. Violette was silent and warm. The gas in the tiny hall was turned low. The door ajar on the right showed a room also dimly lit, with a saucepan of milk ready to heat on the gas ring, and a plate of Albert biscuits, and a sense of recent occupation. It is very clear in an empty room by night what sort of people have sat and talked and occupied themselves in it by day. 
their thoughts and words lie about, with their books and sewing. There are also in this room crochet doilies on the chairs and tables, a large photograph of a stout and heavily moustached gentleman above the piano, Mr. Tucker, a small photograph of a thin and shaven and scholarly gentleman over the writing table, Professor Frampton, some Marcus Stones, Landseers, and other reproductions round the walls, two bright blue vases on the chimney piece containing some yellow flowers of the kind that age cannot wither, dry, rustling, and immortal. Thou seest me, illuminated in pink and gold letters, circling the picture of a monstrous eye, an indubitably true remark, for no inhabitant of the room could fail to see it, and the evening thrill and the lover's heritage, Mrs. Blankley's latest novel, lying on the table. Alex sat on the table and smoked another cigarette. She always smoked far too many. She was pale, with heavy, sleep-shadowed eyes. She had talked and smoked and been funny all the evening. One o'clock struck. Alex turned out the gas and went up to bed quietly, lest she should disturb the family. She crept into the bedroom she shared with Evie and undressed by the light that came in through the half-curtained window from the darkened lamps in the street. The faint light showed Evie asleep in her lovely grace, the grace of some lithe, young, wild animal. Alex never tired of absorbing the various aspects of this lovely grace. She got into bed and curled herself up. Between the half-drawn window curtains she could see the tops of the park trees waving and fluttering their boughs in a dark sky where clouds drove across the waning moon. Footsteps beat in the road outside, came near, passed and died. The policeman trod and retrod his allotted sphere, guarding Violette while it drifted drowsily into the summer dawn, which broke through light, whispering rain. Alex dreamed. In Flanders the rain sloped down onto men standing too in slippery trenches, yawning, shivering, listening. 2. Evie pulled back the curtain and the yellow day broke into Alex's dreams and opened her sleepy eyes. She yawned, her thin arms, like a child's arms, stretched above her head. "'Oh, Evie,' said Alex, "'can't be morning, is it?' "'Not half,' said Evie, collecting her sponges and towels for her bath. "'It's last night still. Whatever time did you get back, child?' Evie was a year younger than Alex, but more experienced, in her pink kimono dressing gown, with her long brown plait down her back, and her face softly flushed from the pillow, she looked like the blossom a hazel nut might have had, had it been so arranged. Twelve, one, two, don't know, Alex yawned and pulled the bedclothes tight under her chin. Think I was too tipsy to notice. Evie, coming back from the bathroom, woke her again. She lay and watched, between sleepy lids, Evie dressing. Drowsily she thought how awfully, awfully pretty Evie was. Evie was lithe and long-limbed, with sudden swift grace of movement like a kitten's or a young panther's. She had a face pink and brown, fine in contour and prettily squared at the jaw, eyes wide and dark and set far apart under level brows and dimples of the violette household evie alone had charm except on saturdays and sundays she trimmed hats at a very superior and artistic establishment in bond street there was a certain adequacy about evie she did but little here below but did that little well Alex sat up in bed, one dark plait hanging on either side of her small pale face, her sharp chin resting on her knees. "'I must do it some time, mustn't I?' she said, and did it forthwith, tumbling out of bed and staggering across to the washstand for her sponge and towel. She dropped and drowned her dreams in her cold bath and came back cool and indifferent.' 
Through the open window the summer morning blew upon her merrily. It was windy, careless, friendly, full of light and laughter. 3. In the dining room when Alex came down were Mrs. Frampton, who was small, trim, fifty-three, and reading a four-page letter, Kate, who was inconspicuous, neat, twenty-nine, and making tea, and Evie, who has already been described, and was perusing two apparently amusing letters. Mrs. Frampton looked up from her letter to say, "'Good morning, dear. You came home with the milk this morning. I can see by those dark saucers. You ought to have stayed in bed and had some breakfast there.' Mrs. Frampton was very kind. She also was very early in going to bed. Anything after midnight was to her with the milk.' Kate said, having made the tea and turned out the gas ring, "'We're all late this morning. "'If we don't commence breakfast quick, I shall never get through my day.' They stood round the table. Mrs. Frampton said, "'For what we're about to receive?' And Kate said, "'Some bacon, mother?' "'A small helping only, love. "'Such a nice long letter from Aunt Nelly. "'Fred and Maudie have been staying with her for the weekend, "'and the baby's tooth begins to get through.' Aunt Nellie's rheumatism is no better, though, and she thinks of Harrogate next month. Do you hear that, Kate? Kate was critically examining a plate. Egg left on it again. If I've spoken to Florence once, I've done so fifty times about egg on plates. I'd better ring for her and speak at once, hadn't I, Mother? She'll never learn otherwise. Do, love. Kate rang. Florence came, and Kate said, Florence, there's egg on this plate again. "'Take it away and bring another, and recollect what I told you about soda.' "'Oh, dear me, dear me,' said Mrs. Frampton, who had opened the paper. "'Just listen to this. One of those Zeppelins came again last night and dropped bombs on the East Coast, killing sixteen and injuring forty. Now isn't that wicked? Babies in the cradle formed a large proportion of the fatalities, as usual. Poor little loves!' You'd think those men would be ashamed with all the civilised world calling them baby killers last time. They're just inhuman murderers, said Kate absently. I expect they're dead to shame by now. This bacon is somewhat less streaky than the last. We must speak to Edwards about it again. I shall tell him we shall really have to deal with Perkins if he can't do better for us. Another slice, Evie. Some more toast, love. "'Mrs. Frampton suggested to Alex, "'and a little preserve. "'You don't eat properly, Alex. "'You'll never grow strong and big and rosy. "'Kate, this tea isn't so nice as the last. "'A touch raspier, it seems. "'What do you think?' "'I prefer it, Mother. "'It has somewhat more taste. "'But if you think it's too strong... "'No, love, I expect you're right. "'Is it the one and ninepenny?' "'One and eight. Evie giggled over her correspondence. "'And who have you heard from, Evie?' asked her mother, looking indulgently at her pretty younger daughter. "'Floss Vinny, for one. She's got some more blouse patterns and wants me to go round again and help her choose. There's one a perfect treat she was thinking of last week. She thinks it'll make up to suit her, but it won't a bit. It's fussy, and she's too fussy already with that frizzy hair.' It would suit me nicely, or you, Alex, but it'll smother Floss. I told her so, but she wouldn't believe me. She thinks Vin will like her in it, but I bet he doesn't. Though, of course, you never can say what a man will like. They're so funny. Oh, dear, they are comic. Evie gurgled over some private experiences of her own. She did not lack them. "'Floss usually looks very nice in her clothes,' said Kate, with delicate heroism, because, for reasons, she disliked to think so. Alex, hearing her, passed her the jam, preserve, Violette called it, impulsively, without being asked, and as a matter of fact, Kate, eating bacon, did not want it. Mrs. Frampton, moved doubtless by some sequence of thought known to herself, said, they say those Belgians in the corner house eat ten pounds of cheese each week. Edward's boy told Florence. Just fancy that. Not that one grudges them anything, poor things. Kate said, Mr. Allison, 
the vicar of the church she attended, says those corner Belgians have been very troublesome indeed lately. They've all quarrelled among themselves, and all but the wounded young man and his mother think the wounded young man is well enough to go to the front now, and he will slam the doors so, and two new ones have come, so they're packed as tight as herrings, but they say Belgians always will overcrowd, and the one that lost her baby on the journey has found it again, and the others aren't pleased because it cries at nights, and they all say they don't get enough to eat. The vicar's had no end of bother with them, and now two of them say they won't stay here, they'll go off to Hull, where Belgians aren't allowed. The vicar reasoned with them ever so long, but they will go. They say they have uncles there. I'm sure it's very wrong if they have. It does seem mad, doesn't it? The lack of discipline among this unhappy people, she meant, rather than the uncles at Hull. Mrs. Frampton said, To think of them behaving like that, after all they've been through. She scanned the paper again, having finished her small breakfast. "'Here's a German in Tottenham Court Road strangled himself with his window cord. Ashamed of his country. Well, who can blame him? We must leave that to his maker. Now listen to this. Lord Harwood says Arrogate is a nest of spies. Quite full of German wives, it is. Fancy. And Aunt Nelly going to take the baths there next month. Lowest off, too.' and Clacton on sea. I'm sure I shall never want to visit any of those East Coast places again. You never know whom to trust, not to mention all these airships coming and being put into jail if you forget to pull the blinds and having your dog confiscated if he runs out by night. Girl robbed her grandmother. She spent it all on dress, too. Fancy, with all the distress there is just now. Home hints. Don't throw away a favourite hat because you think its day is over. Wash it in a solution of water and gum and lay it flat on the kitchen dresser. Stuff the crown with soft paper and stand four flat irons on the brim, but clean the irons well first with brick dust and ammonia. The hat will then be a very nice new shape. Here's a recipe for apple shortcake, Kate. I shall cut that out for Florence. "'Dear me, how late it gets. "'We must all get to our day's work. "'Have you heard news from your mother, Alex, dear?' "'Yes.' "'Alex had two letters before her. "'Mother writes from Athens. "'She's been interviewing Tino, "'don't know how she managed it, "'trying to get him to sit on a council "'for continuous mediation without armistice. "'I gather Tino thinks it's a jolly sound plan in theory, "'but isn't having any in practice.' That's the position of most of the neutral governments, apparently. As none of the family knew what continuous mediation without armistice meant, the only comment forthcoming was from Mrs. Frampton. Your mother is a very wonderful person. I only hope she isn't getting overtired going about as much as she does. You've had some news from the front, too, haven't you? Yes, said Alex. A friend of mine has just got wounded. He's being sent home. Oh, my dear, how unfortunate. Not seriously, I trust. No, I shouldn't think so. A nice blighty one in the hand, he says. He seems quite cheery about it. He tried to return a bomb to the senders, and it went off just before its proper time. It happens often, he says. It must be difficult to calculate about these time bombs. A dreadful risk to take, indeed. It's his left, I suppose, as he writes. He dictated it. No, not his left. The right? Dear me, now, how sad that is. It so hampers a man. What used he to work at, love? He paints. Well, now, isn't that a pity? He must learn to paint left-handed when the war's over, mustn't he? But I hope his hand will be quite well again long before then. It's given you quite a shock, dearie, I can see... "'You've gone quite pale. "'Would you like a little sal volatile? "'No, thank you, Cousin Emily. "'It's not given me a shock a bit. "'Do you want me to do the lamps, Kate? "'Well, I don't know why you should. "'Evie's nothing to do this morning.' "'Kate looked doubtfully at her sister, who said promptly, "'Oh, hasn't she? That's all you know. "'I'm for cutting out morning. "'Thanks muchly, Alex. "'I'll do the dusting if you'll do the lamps.' 
4. Kate retired to domestic duties in the back regions. Evie, before doing the dusting, took up the daily message and glanced through the feuilleton. It had been the same feuilleton for many weeks. It was always headed by a synopsis and a list of characters, John Hargreave, a strong, quiet man of deep feeling, to whom anything underhand is abhorrent, Valerie Lascelles, a beautiful girl of nineteen who loves John, Sylvia, her sister, exactly like Valerie in face but not in character, for she is shallow and hard and lives abroad, the widow of a foreign count, Cyril Arbuthnot, a smart man about town, unscrupulous in his methods, who sticks at nothing. No wonder Evie found it interesting. Then she flicked competently round the drawing-room with a duster, calling to Florence to clear away quick, because she wanted the table for cutting out. Alex did the lamps in the pantry. Mrs. Frampton did accounts and wrote to Aunt Nelly in the dining-room. Florence cleared away, also in the dining-room. Kate looked in in her hat and coat with the little red books that come from shops on a Saturday morning. "'I'd better get in a new tongue, I suppose, mother. "'The one we have will scarcely be sufficient for Sunday. "'Yes, dear, get one of the large ones.' "'Kate went bill-paying. "'Evie extracted incomprehensibly shaped pieces of brown paper "'from the pages of Home Chat, a weekly periodical which she took in, "'and began her cutting-out morning. "'Alex returned from the lamps and said, "'I'm going out for the day with some people.' "'I may go on to Nicholas in the evening, very likely.' "'It may or may not have been before mentioned "'that Alex had a brother of that name. "'Very well, dear. "'Bring your brother or some of your friends back with you afterwards, if you like. "'I'm sure it would be very nice if they stopped to supper. "'Our supper's simple, but there's always plenty for all, "'and the Vinnies are coming round afterwards, "'so we shall be a nice party. "'I asked them because they've got that cousin Miss Simon staying with them, and I thought they'd be glad of an evening's change for her. That fatty in a sailor blouse, Evie, who observed clothes, commented, I should think they'd be glad of a change from her. She's a suffragette, and talks the weirdest stuff. She's as good as a play to listen to. I shouldn't think your brother would get on with the Vinnies a bit, Alex. Probably not, said Alex. He doesn't with most people. Evie looked as if she shouldn't think he did. "'What's the name of that new floor polish to tell Aunt Nelly?' said Mrs. Frampton, pausing in her letter. But as Kate was out, and it was neither Roanoke nor Cherry Blossom, suggestions of unequal levels of intelligence from Evie and Alex, she had to leave a space for it. End of chapter 4《ハッピーバースデー』『ハッピーバースデー』『ハッピーバースデー』『ハッピーバースデー』This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Afternoon Out Alex sat on the bus and rushed through the shining summer morning down Upper Clapton Road, Lower Clapton Road, Mare Street, Hackney Road, Shoreditch, Bishopsgate and so into the city. The noon war news leaped from placards in black and red and green. A mile of trenches taken near Festubert, a mile of trenches lost again. Alex did not care and would not look. Anyhow, it wasn't Paul's part of the line. London was damp and shining under a windy blue sky. They had cleared away the bodies of those struck down last night by motor buses in the dark. What a sacrifice of life! Was it worth while? The traffic was held up every now and then by companies of recruits swinging along in khaki and mufti, jolly, absorbed, resolute, self-conscious or amused. There went down Threadneedle Street the artists' rifles. Some looked like studio artists, pale, intelligent, sometimes spectacled, Others more like pavement artists, others again suggested sign-painters. But this last was probably an illusion, as sign-painters since last August have been mostly too busy painting out and repainting names on signs to have time for soldiering. 
Many classes have lost heavily by this war, such as publicans, milliners, writers, Belgians, domestic servants, university lecturers, publishers, artists, actors and newspapers. But some have gained. Among these are sheep growers, house agents, sugar merchants, munition makers, colliers, coal owners and sign painters. An unequal world. The bus waited, held up opposite a recruiting station. Alex, looking down, met the hypnotic stare of the great man pictured on the walls and turned away, checking a startled giggle. Anyhow, she was lame and not the sex which goes either, worse luck. On that desperate route of bitterness she never dwelt. That way madness lay. Her swerving eyes fell next on one of the pictures of domestic life designed and executed, so common report had it, by the same great man. The picture in which an innocent and reproachful infant inquires of a desperately embarrassed but apparently not irate parent. Daddy, what did you do to help when Britain fought for freedom in 1915? Alex giggled again and looked up at the white clouds racing across the summer sky where there was no war nor rumours of war. 2. At Bond Street she left the bus and went to Grafton Street where there was a small exhibition of pictures by two young artists known to Alex. Here she met by appointment three friends, her fellow students at the art school. Their names were Noni McClure, Oliver Bannister and Thomas Ashe. Miss McClure and Mr Bannister were there before her. They greeted her with, What cheer, Joanna? Joanna, because in a play composed and produced recently by their combined talent, Alex had taken this part. Alex went to speak to the exhibitors who were standing about and failing to look detached and began to look round, murmuring to her friends, "'What's this show like? Oh, she's got that yellow thing in,' and so forth. Presently Mr Thomas Ash joined them. It may here be mentioned, lest readers should be unfairly prejudiced against Mr Ash and Mr Bannister, that one of them had a frozen lung and the other a distended aorta. They were quite good young men, really, and would have preferred to go. They criticised and appreciated the pictures for an hour, with the interesting criticism and over-appreciation usually poured forth by young persons on the works of their fellow students and contemporaries, often at the expense of the older and staler, and less in the only movement that really matters. "'That's like some of Doy's things,' said one of the young men, and the other said, "'Doy's wounded, isn't he?' I saw it in the paper today. I hope it's not much. Alex said it wasn't. He's on his way home. I hope they send him to a hospital in town so we can all go and see him. Noni McClure shot her a curious glance. She had never known quite how deep the intimacy between these two had gone. She sometimes wondered. She had thought just before the war that it went very deep indeed. But in these present days, Alex seemed prepared to play round at large with so many young men, and to flirt, when that was the game, with a light-handed recklessness only exceeded by Noni herself. And Noni, of course, was notorious. 3. They went out to lunch. The world is divided into those who have lunch in their own homes, those who have lunch in someone else's, those who have lunch in hotel restaurants, those who have lunch in nice eating shops, those who have lunch in less nice eating shops, such as ABCs, those who have lunch in eating shops very far from nice, those who have lunch in handkerchiefs, and those who do not have lunch at all. The classes are, of course, not rigid. Many people alternate from day to day between one and another of them. Alex and her friends were, most days, either in class four or class five. Today they were in class four, being out for a happy day, and they had lunch in a little place in Soho, full of orange trees in green tubs and sunshine and macaroni. They found one another interesting, entertaining and attractive. Noni McClure was dark and good-looking, a fitfully brilliant worker and a consistently lively companion. 
Oliver Bannister was gentle and fair and delicate, and indifferent to most things, only not to art or to Noni McClure. He had tried to get passed for the army, but as he was rejected, he settled down tranquilly and without the bitterness that eats the souls of so many of the medically and sexually unfit. He recognised the compensations of his lot. Tommy Ash, on the other hand, was bitter and angry like Alex. Like her, he would have hated the war anyhow, even if he had been fighting, being a sensitive and intelligent youth. But as it was, he loathed it so much that he would never mention it unless he had to, and then only with a sneer. It was partly this that drew him to Alex, and her to him. They were in the same case, so they found they could trust one another not to talk of the indecent monster. Also, he admired her unusual, delicate, ironic type. Anyhow, it was a fashion to have some special friend among the girls at the school, and it helped one to forget. So he and Alex plunged into a flirtation not normally natural to either. The four of them flirted and ragged and joked, and were funny all the afternoon, which they spent in Richmond Park. Alex and Tommy Ash went off together and lost the other two, and lay on the grass, and became rather more intimate than they had ever been before. When soldiers strolled by, they looked the other way, and pretended not to see, and talked very fast about anything that came into their heads. Sometimes the soldiers were wounded. Once a party of them, in hospital blues, sat down quite near them, with two girls in VAD uniform, who called the soldiers by their surnames and chaffed them. They were all being merry and funny and having a good time. One was a boy of eighteen, pink-cheeked and hilarious, with his right leg cut short just below the thigh. "'Look here, it's time we found those two people,' said Alex, sitting up. "'We must really set about it in earnest.' So they went away, but presently they felt more like tea than finding the others, so they had some. When finally the party joined itself together, it went to Earl's Court, and had a hilarious hour flip-flapping, wiggle-woggling, and joy-wheeling. It desisted at half-past six, dishevelled, battered and bruised, and separated to fulfil its respective evening engagements. 4. Alex went to see her brother Nicholas. Nicholas was a journalist, on the staff of a weekly paper which cost sixpence, and with whose politics he was not in agreement. As there was no paper, weekly, sixpenny or otherwise, with whose politics he was in agreement, this was not strange. It may further be premised of Nicholas that he was twenty-seven years old, of good abilities, thought war too ridiculous a business for him to take part or lot in, was probably medically unfit to do so, but would not for the world have had it proved, was completely lacking in any sense of veneration for anything, negligently put aside as absurd all forms of supernatural religion, shared rooms with a curate friend in Clifford's Inn, and had from an infant reacted so violently against the hereditary enthusiasm which nevertheless looked irrepressibly out of his eyes, that he had landed himself with an unintelligent degree of cynicism in all matters. Hither Alex went, when the evening sunshine lay mellow on Chancery Lane. Alex had a curious and quite unaccountable feeling for Chancery Lane. It seemed to her romantic beyond all reason. Just now it was as a some wild lane on the battlefront, or like a trench which has been shelled, for the most recent airship raid had ploughed it up. A week ago it had been the scene of that wild terror and shrieking confusion which is characterised by a euphemistic press as no panic. Alex limped past the chaos quickly. An old man tried to sell her a paper. Star Lady, Globe, Pall Mall, Evening News. British failed to hold conquered trenches. Alex hurried by. The news vendor turned his attention to someone else. Evening papers, of course, are interesting and should not really be missed. 
They often contain so much news that is ephemeral and fades away before the morning into the light of common day. They are as perishable and never to be repeated as some frail and lovely flower. But Alex, ignoring them, reached Clifford's Inn and climbed the narrow oak stairway to the rooms inscribed Mr. N. I. Sandemir, Reverend C. M. V. West. Both these gentlemen were in their sitting room. The Reverend C. M. V. West reposed on a wicker couch, reading alternately two weekly church papers and the Cambridge magazine. One of these papers was high church, another broad church. The third did not hold with churches. The Reverend C. M. V. West was a refined-looking young man, very neatly cassocked, with a nice face and a sense of humour. In justice to him, we must say that he worked very hard as a rule, but had been enjoying a deserved rest before evensong. To Alex, he stood for a queer force that was at work in the world, and which she had been brought up to consider retrograde. Nicholas Sandomir lay in an easy chair, surrounded by review copies of books. He was too broad-shouldered for his height. He was pale and prominent-jawed, with something of the Slav cast of feature. His mouth, like Alex's, was the mouth of a cynic. His eyes, small, overhung, and deep blue, were the eyes of an idealist. This paradox of his face was only one among many paradoxes in him. He was unreliable. He disbelieved in all churches and lived unaccountably with a high church curate. This probably was because he liked him personally and also liked to have an intelligent person constantly at hand to disagree with. Also he came on his father's side of a race of devout and mystic Catholics. He despised war and looked with contempt on peace societies. This was perhaps because, so far as he worshipped anything, he worshipped efficiency and found both peace societies and war singularly lacking in this quality. He detested Germany as a power and loathed the Russia who was combating her. This doubtless was because he was half a Pole. Anyhow, this evening, when Alex came in, he was sulkily, even viciously, turning the pages of a little book he had to review, called, it was one of a series, The Effects of the War on Literature. He waved his disengaged hand at Alex and left it to West, who had much better manners, to get up and put a chair for her and pass and light her a cigarette. "'Did you meet Belgians on the stairs?' inquired West. They've put some in the rooms above us, the rooms that used to be Hans Bowers. Five of them, isn't it, Sandemir? Five to rise, Nicholas replied. The baby due next week, I'm told. Unarrived babies were among the things not alluded to at Violette in mixed company. No wonder Violette found Nicholas peculiar. It's awkward, West added, lowering his voice and glancing at one of the shut bedroom doors, because we keep a German and they can't meet. "'What do you do that for?' asked Alex unsympathetically. "'Awkward, isn't it?' said West. "'Because they keep coming to see us, the Belgians, I mean. "'They like us, rather. "'And he,' he nodded at the bedroom, "'has to scoot in there till they're gone. "'It's like dogs and cats. "'They simply can't be let to meet. "'Well, I don't know what you want with a German, anyhow.' "'He's a friend of ours,' explained Nicholas. He was living in the Golders Green Garden City, and it became so disagreeable for him, they're all so exposed there, you know, nothing hid, that we asked him here instead. If they find him, he's afraid they may put him in a concentration camp, and of course if the Belgians sighted him, they'd complain. He means no harm, but unfortunately he had a concrete lawn in his garden, about ten feet square, where he used to bounce a ball for exercise. Also he had made a level place on his roof, among Mr. Raymond Unwin's sloping tiles, where he used to sit and admire the distant view through a spyglass. It's all very black against him. But he's a studious and innocent little person, really, and he'd hate to be concentrated. It would make one feel so like essence of beef, wouldn't it? West murmured absently. He's not a true patriot, went on Nicholas. He wants the Hohenzollerns to be guillotined 
and a disruptive country of small warring states to be re-established. He writes articles on German internal reform for the monthly reviews. He calls them Kill or Cure, or A Short Way with Imperialism, or some such bloody title. I don't care for his English literary style, but his intentions are excellent. Well, and how's life? Nicholas turned his small, keen blue eyes on his sister. You look as if you've been out for a joy day. You want some more hairpins, but we don't keep any here. I've been wiggle-woggling, Alex admitted, and added frankly, I feel jolly sick after it. Our family constitution, said her brother, is quite unfit for the strains we habitually subject it to. Mine is. I feel jolly sick too, but my indisposition is incurred in the path of duty. I've got to review the things, so I have to read them, a little here and there anyhow, and then, just as one feels one has reached one's limit, one gets a handbook of wisdom like this to finish one off. He read a page at random from the effects of the war on literature. The war is putting an end to sordidness and littleness, in literature as in other spheres of human life. The second rate, the unheroic, the earthy, the petty, the trivial, how does it look now, seen in the light of the guns that blaze over Flanders? The guns, shattering so much, have at least shattered falsity in art. We were degenerate a little in our literature and in our lives. We have been made great. We have come surely to the heroic, the epic pitch of living. If we cannot express it with a voice worthy of it, then indeed it has failed in its deepest lesson to us. We may expect a renaissance of beauty worthy to rank with the romantic revival born of the French wars. Who is the liar? asked Alex. Nicholas named him. I am thinking, he added, of starting an effects of the war series of my own. I shall call it some further effects. It will be designed to dump the spirits of the sanguine. I shall do the one on literature myself. I shall take revenge in it for all the mush I've had to review lately. It's extraordinary, the stream of, of the heroic and the epic, isn't that it, that pours forth daily. The war seems to have given an unhealthy stimulus to hundreds of minds and thousands of pens. One knew it would, of course. No doubt it was the same during the siege of Troy and all the great wars. Though, thank heaven, we shall never know, as that sort of froth is blown away pretty quick and lost to posterity. It's only the unhappy and contemporaries who get it splashed all over them. And this war is beastlier than any other so the rubbish is less counteracted by the decent writers. The first-rate people, both the combatants and non-combatants, are too much disgusted, too upset, to do first-rate work. The war's going on, and means to go on, too long. Wells or someone said months ago that people don't so much think about it as get mentally scarred. It's quite true. Lots of people have got to the stage when they can only feel, not think, and the best people hate the whole business much too much to get any renaissance of beauty out of it. Who was it who said the other day that the writers to whom war is glamorous aren't as a rule the ones who produce anything fit to call literature? War's an insanity, and insane things, purely destructive, wasteful, hideous, brutal, ridiculous things, aren't what makes art. The war's produced a little fine poetry among a sea of tosh, a thing here and there, but mostly, oh good Lord, the flood of cheap heroics and all commonplace patriotic claptrap, it's swept slobbering all over us, there seems no stemming it, literary revival be hanged, all we had before, and precious little it was, of decent work, clear and alive and sane and close to reality, is being trampled to bits by this, this imbecile brute, and when the time comes to collect the bits and try to begin again, we shan't be able to. There'll be no more spirit in us. We shall be too battered and beaten. Nicholas wound up to excitement, was talking too long at a stretch. He often did, being an egoist, and having in his veins the blood of many eloquent and excited revolutionary Poles who had stood in marketplaces and talked and talked, gesticulating, pouring forth blood and fire. 
Nicholas reacting against this fervour, repudiating gesticulation, blood and fire, still talked. But on battered and beaten he paused, in disgusted emphasis, and West came in, half absently, still turning the pages of the challenge, talking in his high clear voice, monotonous and fast. Nicholas was guttural and harsh. "'You underrate the power of human recovery. "'You always do. "'It's immense, as a matter of fact. "'Give us fifty years, twenty, ten. "'Besides, look at the compensations. "'If the good are battered and beaten, the bad are too. "'It's a well-known fact that many of the futurist poets "'in all the nations have gone mad "'through trying to get too many battle noises into their heads at once. "'So they at least are silenced.' I suppose they still write in their asylums. In fact, I've heard they do. My uncle is an asylum doctor, but it gets no further. He subsided into the Cambridge magazine. Well, I'd rather have the futurists than the slops poured out by the people who unfortunately haven't brain enough even to go mad, Nicholas grumbled. And anyhow, I don't believe in any of your uncles. You've too many. The futurists at least were trying to keep close to facts, even if they couldn't digest them, but brought them up with strident noises. But these imbeciles, the war seems to be a sort of tonic to their syrupy little souls, it's filled them up with vim and banal joy. Not that the rot that has always been rot particularly matters. It merely means that the people who used to express themselves in one inane way now choose another, no worse but it's the silencing or the unmanning of the good people that matters. It's Cathcart's new book. I've just read it. It's the work of a shaken, broken man. It's weak, irrational, drifting, with no constructive purpose, no coherence. You can almost hear the guns crashing into it as he tried to write, and the atrocity reports shrieking in his ears, and the poison gas stifling him, and the militarists and pacifists raving round him. His whole world's run off its rails, and upset and broken to bits, and he can't put it right side up again. He's lost his faith in it. He can only fumble and stammer at it helplessly, weak and maundering and incoherent. He ought to be helping to build it up again, but he's lost his constructive power. Hundreds of people have. Constructive force will be the one thing needed when the war is over. Anyone with a programme and the brain and will to carry it out. But where's it to come from? Those who aren't killed or cut to bits will be too adrift and demoralised and dazed to do anything intelligent. We're fast losing even such mental coherence and concentration as we had. Look, for instance, at the two while I'm talking, quite interestingly, too. Are you listening? Certainly not. West is reading a church newspaper, and Alex drawing cats on the margins of my proofs. I'm not blaming you. You can't help it. You're mentally and probably morally shattered. I am too. People are more than ever like segregated imbeciles, each absorbed in his or her own ploy. Effects of the war on human intelligence? That shall be one of my series. I've spent an idiotic day. So have both of you, I should guess. Yet we all three have natural glimmerings of intelligence. I've not spent an idiotic day, said West placidly. Nicholas looked at him sardonically. Well, let's hear about it. By all means. West drew a long breath and began even faster than usual. I'll skip my before breakfast proceedings, which you wouldn't understand, but they weren't in the least idiotic. After breakfast, I spent an hour talking to a friend of mine on leave from France. The conversation was very interesting and instructive, for me anyhow. We talked about how rotten the grub in the trenches is, how shameless the air sea are, how unreliable time fuse bombs, and so on. Then, since I am a parson, he kindly talked my shop for a change, and naturally very soon Jonah pushed his head in, and Noah and a few more of the gentlemen who seemed to keep the church doors shut against the British working man. I kicked them outside the church onto the dust heap and left them there. I hoped to his satisfaction, and came home and wrote a sermon advocating the disuse of the custom of perusing early Hebrew history 
or reading it in churches. It's quite a good sermon, as my sermons go. By the way, that may, I'm hoping, be one of the effects of the war on the church. We'll all of us become so anxious to bring the working man into it, and it's very certain he won't come in with the Old Testament legends barring the way. I'll write that one of your series for you, if I may. Well, then I had lunch with a lady who's interested in factory girls' trade unions, and we discussed the ways and means of them. That was jolly useful. He's one of the clergymen, you know, Nicholas explained aside to Alex, who had been said by an eminent dean to be tumbling over one another in their anxiety to become court chaplains to King Demos. He's hopelessly behind the times, of course, because Demos is in fetters now. West's an Edwardian churchman, though he fancies neo-post-Georgian. "'Oh, I'm as early as you like,' West said amiably. "'Pre-Edwardian, Victorian, or even Pauline. I don't mind. "'Well, then I attended a meeting of my parish branch of the UDC. "'The meeting was broken up by rioters, "'so I addressed them from a window on freedom of speech. "'My vicar came along as I was doing so,' and came in and lectured me on taking part in political movements. So I stopped, and did some parish visiting instead, and had a good deal of interesting conversation, and incidentally was given very strong tea at three different houses. Then I came home, and read the Church Times, the Challenge, and the Cambridge Magazine. All interesting in their way, and quite different. No, I know you don't like any of them, People write to the challenge every week asking, are Christianity and war compatible? And come to the conclusion that they are not, but that Christians may often have to fight. People write to the Church Times saying that they have found a clergyman who won't wear a chasuble, and what shall they do to him? People write to the Cambridge Magazine saying that everyone over 40 should be disenfranchised and interned, if not shot. Jolly good papers all the same. How can they help being written to? None of us can. I get written to myself. Well, next I'm going to church to read Evensong, and for an hour after Evensong, but you wouldn't understand about that. Anyhow, eventually I have supper with the vicar. He ran down with a jerk and turned to Alex, who had been following him with some interest. That's not an idiotic day. Not from my point of view, he informed her. Sounds all right she said, but it's not the sort of day Nicholas and I were brought up to understand, you know. We know nothing about the church, from not going, I suppose. You should go, he assured her. You'd find it interesting. Of course, it's been largely a failure so far, and dull in lots of ways, because we've not yet fulfilled its original intention. It hasn't so far succeeded in preventing, though it's fought them and largely lessened them, any of the things it's out to prevent commercialism and cant and cruelty and classes and lies and hate and war it's got to break the world to bits and put it together again and before it can do that it's got to break itself to bits and put itself together it's got to become like dynamite and blow up the rubbish its own rubbish first then the world's he consulted his wristwatch said i must go shook hands with alex and went quickly trim and alert and neat, to blow up the world. He talks too much, said Nicholas in his hearing. Who doesn't in these days? I do myself. It's better than to talk too little. If we say a great deal, we may say a word of sense sometimes. If we say very little, the odds that all we do say is rubbish, from lack of practice. He yawned. You'd better stay to dinner. I've got Andreevich Romevsky coming to meet Adolf Kopfer, our German friend. So talk on the European situation will be hampered and constrained. Funny thing he stands for, Alex commented, still thinking of Mr West. The church, I suppose it really is out to stop war. Presumably, but as his representatives say, his endeavours so far have been a frost. It has been as unsuccessful as the peace conference his mother attends but apparently the members of both are obliged by their faith to be incurable optimists. West's always full of life and hope. Nothing daunts him. Funny, Alex mused still. The thought glanced through her. Clergymen can't fight either. 
They're like me. Perhaps religion helps them to forget. Takes their mind off. Like painting. Like Richmond Park and Tommy Ash. Like wiggle-woggling, I wonder. On that wonder she left the church and said, Cousin Emily asked me to bring you back to supper with me. You'd meet the Vinnies from the nutshell, who are coming in afterwards, so we should be a nice party, she says. But Evie says you and the Vinnies wouldn't get on. I don't think Evie thinks you're fit for respectable society at all. So you'd better not come. Shouldn't dream of it, Nicholas grunted, even if I hadn't got Russians and Germans coming here. You and your violettes and your nutshells. It beats me what you think you're up to there. Alex gave her faint, enigmatic smile. It's nice and peaceful, she said, like cotton wool. Well, good night, Nicky. No, I won't stay to dinner, thanks. You can tackle your own awkward social situations for yourself. I'm for Violette. 5. She limped down the wooden stairs, and the court was golden in the evening light, a haven beyond which the wild river of Fleet Street surged. Special war extra, British driven back. The cries, the placards, were like lost ships tossed lightly on the top of wild waters. They would soon sink if one did not listen or look. End of chapter 5